In this video lecture, we're going to trace through an execution of a functional program. And if you remember in class, we actually did talk about the trace function. So here I have a quicksort partition program that's already defined. And I am just going to use the trace command. once to empty list. You can see how it traced it uh, each call. So the first call was made with um, this 10, 11, 13, and 3. The next time you can see that the 11 was pulled off and put into the so-called greater list uh, and we're still processing 13 and 3. This is QSort partition. Then you can see the next call, it um, took the 13 here, it added it to the greater list again, leaving us with a list of three. The final call put the three onto the lesser list, and we still had the uh, greater list. The last call is with a uh, actual empty list this is it right here and so it's going to return these two lists and that's the return result right there it's the list 3 and then the list consisting of 13 and 11 and then each of these are simply the return values from the other calls as we unwind the stack so trace is a very useful uh, tool the other a uh, useful one is to put print statements in, and that's, if you recall, with the display um, function. So if you say, for example, display uh, Brad, it will display Brad. If I had a let statement, we'll say A6, and we said display A, it would display 6, and we could say A6 uh, display uh, a equals, and you'll notice it doesn't take two arguments. I got an error right there because display only takes one. So if I actually, so if I actually want to print this out, I'd have to put it in separate statements. So display a equals display a. Actually, if I want a new line, I could say new line, and I get as you can see a equals six. And the new line is the unspecified return value, but you get, also you do get the new line after A equals six. Okay, so display and trace are two ways to uh, trace your execution of a function and help you debug it. But let's just go through kind of a beefier example. And we're going to go through the example in the book of a deterministic finite automata. And what we're doing is we are writing a deterministic finite automata that will accept strings with an even number of zeros and an even number of ones. So for example, uh, this would be an unacceptable string because it has an odd number of both. Uh, this one would be acceptable because it has an even number of ones and an even number of zeros. Uh, this is also acceptable an even number of zeros and an even number of ones. So um, that's what it does. There's four states. Uh, Q0 has even zeros and even ones. Q1, you may want to think about for a moment. Well, you can see Q takes a one. So what we're doing is we have an even number of zeros but an odd number of ones. And you can see if we go now to Q3 that that is going to be an odd number of zeros and an odd number of ones. And finally Q2, if we're coming here from Q0 with an even number of both and we see a zero, we must be going to a state that has an odd number of zeros and a even number 
of ones. So if we were to simulate this finite automata, say on the string 101101, uh, you can see we start at state Q0 right here. And the first one would send us to Q1. Then the zero, this zero right here, would send us to Q3. This one is going to send us to Q2 because we now have an even number of ones but an odd number of zeros. The one sends us back to Q3. The zero sends us up to Q1 because we now have an even number of zeros and an odd number of ones. And the 1 sends us from Q1 back to Q0, which is the accepting state because we have an even number of both zeros and 1s. So that's a quick illustration of our deterministic finite automata. And what we're going to be uh, writing a function to do is to simulate any arbitrary deterministic finite automata. And what we're asking the user to give us is three inputs. The start state, the set of final states as a list. So uh, there can be multiple final states. And then the transition function as a list of pairs. So the first element of the pair is the current state and an input element. The second element of the pair is the state we transition to. So, for example, if we're in Q0 and we see a 1, we transfer to Q1. That's what this pair right here says. So basically, our input, three inputs, start state, trans transition function as a uh, list of pairs and the final states as a list of final states. So now let's take a look at our code and our basic uh, function is our simulate function up here and it's going to take a uh, DFA which is what you just saw the triple with the start state, transition function, and final states, and then an input string, the input. And what it's going to be doing is doing a series of moves, and ultimately what its output is supposed to be is the states that we visit it, and then either accept or reject. So when we're done, what we want is the set of states. So let's say we went to Q0, Q1, maybe went to Q2. We can't go directly to Q2 from Q1. Let's say Q3, maybe Q2, back to Q1, Q0. And finally, if we stop there, it would be an accept. So what we're going to get out of simulate is a list of the states that we visited and ultimately whether or not we accepted our input. So we also are defining a set of convenience functions that are giving more informative names than say car or could or the like. So we're going to assume that the current state of the DFA, we're going to just define a function current state. Remember that there's three arguments for the DFA. The DFA consists of a current state, which I'm abbreviating CS, a transition function, which I'm abbreviating TF, and a set of final states, which I'm abbreviating FS. So current state is going to be the car of that DFA. The transition function is this thing called CATR. CATR stands for car of cutter. So if you take the cutter of this DFA, you would have TF. So if you took the first, let's just do it. So if you first took the cutter, this right here would evaluate to TF and FS. And if we then take the car of that, we end up with TF, the transition function, 
which is what we were aiming for over here by taking the so-called catter on this on a DFA. And the same thing, this C-A-D-D-R really means take the car of the cutter of the cutter. And again, if we have the DFA description of current state, transition function, and final state, then this first cutter is going to yield TF and FS, which when we apply this cutter to it, is going to yield the list FS. And when we apply the car to that list, we'll end up with the set of final states. So again, we frequently use these uh, kind of alias functions as to provide more meaningful names for the functions we're using in our program. So then the function we have here, define in final, is asking, is a function that simply checks to see whether uh, the current state of the DFA is among the final states of the DFA. So again, we define final states here. It's just returning the list of the um, final states. And this memq, if you remember, is simply a find operator that determines whether a um, string or symbol, in this case, uh, whatever the current state is, is going to be in this list. And if it does, you may remember that it returns the uh, remainder of the list. So for example, if I say memq, and let's say it was q1, and let's say the set of states was q0, q1, q2, and q3, then the result of this would be the list q1, q2, q3, because q1 is the first matching symbol, and then we include the rest of the list. So this is, in effect, just returning uh, a way of saying yes or no, although what it's really doing is returning uh, the list that contains q1 if, in fact, it were there. The next function we want to consider is the move function, and I have both uh, zoomed in on the move function and also uh, over here put the description again for our simulated DFA. Remember the Q0 here is the, uh, the beginning state, this is the transition function, this is the final state. So we're coming into move, the DFA is exactly what we have over here, this description. The symbol is the one that we're going to be making a move on. So let's say that the symbol is 1, because it could be either 0 or 1. We're considering a strings of zeros and 1s. So we want to make a move based on the current set of the DFA. Now, this won't always be Q0. What move is going to be doing is changing that state depending on what the symbol is. So let's see what's going on. We start by setting the current state to be um, the first element of the DFA. So in, that, in this case, CS gets set to Q0. And then the transition function, trans, is going to get set to point to this list right here. And we are now going to create a new DFA state. So this list right here is creating three elements. This is the first element. Whoops, right here is the first element. That's going to be the new current state. This is simply our uh, transition function, which is unchanged. And we're also simply going to include the current set of final states. So the second and third arguments don't change. Move is only concerned with changing this one value right here. So what it does is it first says if the um, current state is equal to an error, 
we're simply going to leave it as an error. Otherwise, we're going to try to find the current state and its symbol in the transition function and try to make a change. Well, in this case, CS is Q0, so this list right here is making a pair, Q0 for the current state, and the symbol we said was 1. And what it's going to try to do is find this pair in this list. Well, as you can see, coming over here, you do indeed find the pair right there. So, pair is now, we'll put it over here, pair is going to get set to Q0, 1, and the transition to Q1. So now, this statement says, if pair, which is true in this takes, we're going to take the catter of the pair. Remember that simply catter is equal to the car of the cutter of this thing. Okay, so the cutter is Q1, and which actually this is part of a list, so um, this pair is really a list. So what we're doing is getting the list Q1, and then when we take the car, we get Q1. And so what's going to get returned is right here. We're going to end up replacing this Q0 with Q1. Now this is actually an entirely new list that we're returning. So even though I scratched out Q0, making it look like it was a side effect, it's really not. This is a completely new list that move is passing back as the result. So all move is doing is finding what the new current state is based on whatever the current state is and the symbol. And notice that if we had not found a transition out of here, let's say the symbol had been a 2, then we would have produced an error for a current state that would have put error here and error would have been propagated through the rest of the simulation. I've now zoomed back so that you can see all of the code for our DFA simulator. and I'm going to move back up and talk about our simulate function again. Remember that what we want to do is return a list of all the states that we entered as we processed our symbols and then whether we accept it or rejected it. And remember back to the function creation video, and I said that you can either do tail recursion construction or you can do inductive construction. If you remember, inductive construction occurs when you, in effect, do post-processing. You uh, solve the problem for the rest of the list, and then you um, prepend the result from the current uh, instantiation of the function. And this is what simulate is. It is a inductive construction because what it is doing to create this list over here is that it is consing whatever the current state of the DFA is. So initially that current state is Q0. And it is consing that with this expression right here. So if the inputs exhaust it, then we're simply checking to see whether we are in a accepting state, a fi accepting final state, and either returning accept or reject. That, in effect, is our base case right here is accept or reject when our input is empty. Otherwise, the inductive case is to do the simulation on the remainder of the input. And that's exactly what's happening. So the simulate is what's creating the rest of this list right here. And then we're prepending the current state to it. So you can see we're simulating. And what we're doing is we are passing, again, two arguments to simulate. So the move function right here is simply updating the current state of the DFA 
and saying that then you're going to simulate it on the rest of the input. So as an example, let's say that we had 1, 0, uh, 1, 0. Okay, this is what would correspond to the set of states that we see right here. So if we're going to now trace simulate, initially sim simulate is getting the DFA that we see here and it is getting the input that we see here. I'm actually going to erase the list because while this may be the end result, it's not what we're going to have at the beginning. So this is our input 1010. Let's put this input actually right at the top here. And when we come in, we cons the current state, which you can see is Q0. So that's going to cons Q0 to whatever is going to get uh, returned by this call to simulate. So we end up calling simulate, put it right here, and it is going to move the DFA with the car of the input. Well, the car of the input is 1. And you can see down here from the transitions thing that if we're in state Q0 and in 1, we'll end up with a new DFA that has a current state of Q1. So really, when we're simulating, we're going into Q1, and our input for this simulate is going to be 0, 1, 0, which is the rest of this input string. So now we're in state Q1, and you can see the first thing that happens with the simulate is we cons the current state. Well, that is Q1. So we're consing Q1, and again, we're going to be calling simulate recursively on what will be left of the input. Well, first of all, we have to move, and you can see we're going to move based on this zero. So when we come down here into move with our DFA at Q1, an input symbol of zero, you can see that we're going to end up choosing this right here and we're going to make a transition to Q3. And we're going to call simulate. We're going to now just have two symbols left, one and zero. So we come in and again, we are into simulate, and we're going to cons the current state, which is Q3. And again, we're going to call simulate down here. And the symbol now, the car of input is 1. You can see going down and looking at our transition diagram that Q3 and 1 map to Q2. So we'll now have a DFA with Q2. And our input now is simply going to be 0. Okay, so actually let's erase that. And our input is a symbol 0. So again, coming in, we first cons our current state, which is Q2. And now we call our move DFA. The car of the input is 0. The cutter of the input is now an empty list, but we first make our move. So with Q2 and a 0, you can see that we are going to select this one right here, and we're going to end up moving into Q0. Okay, so we come in to simulate one more time. We have the empty list. We still do our cons, so we cons Q0, our current state. But now you can see that the input is null, and when we check is final, we find that Q0 is in, a, in the list of final states, so we end up passing back a sept. And that's going to end up completing our list. So to kind of summarize, when you are 
debugging your functions. It helps to use the trace function that Scheme provides. It helps to use the display function that will print out information. But it can also help to do this kind of tracing that I did here by hand to help you understand what's going on. And again, you should be careful to realize that there were no side effects that were being performed by any of these functions. Even though I was scratching out the states here, what was really happening was a completely new list was being created each time. That's the importance of garbage collection is the ability to collect the old garbage that's no longer being used. Also a good optimizing compiler will probably figure out that these two parts of the list are the same and that only this part of the list is being created. So good optimizing compilers or interpreters for scheme won't necessarily recreate the entire list.